end, but it may have been last week. But nonetheless, we will uh, jump in to tonight. We've discussed how to read sentences and how to read paragraphs. And one of the big things that we have been encouraged to do is to look, look, and look some more. To observe. And uh, we've been given tools that have helped us to look closely at what is written to the, the audience and what was written to um, those that the writers were writing to. And it's helped us to take a step back and see how we can apply it today. This is the interpretive journey. And so tonight we're going to look at one more term. Um, we may stretch this out for a few minutes. At least one more term. And this term is discourse. So, a discourse can be a smaller episode with a story such as David and Goliath. Or it can be a longer story such as the narrative of David's life. Or it can be as small as two paragraphs that are joined together. But we're going to learn tonight to how to spot a discourse. And we have to remember that the Bible is not a, a book of stories that's disconnected. It's not discombobulated. It is God-breathed. It is put together how it is put together. And it is for a purpose. But the Bible in a whole is, it tells a story. And so themes are intertwined throughout from, from each text, from each sentence, from each word, from each paragraph. And so um, we're going to learn about discourse. There are numerous markers and connections tied that tie these paragraphs together. While it is critical to start with the small words, and we're going to get into word study later, but we started with reading sentences. We started with reading paragraphs. Now we're going to take a step back and look at a broader picture, the discourse level. So how do we observe large chunks of text? Let's go to Mark chapter 8. Mark chapter 8, verse 22. You do not have to stand for this. Mark chapter 8, verse 22. I'm going to show you something tonight. If you find it, you can say amen. Amen. All right. And he cometh to Bethsaida, and they bring a blind man unto him. And besought him to touch him. And he took the blind man by the hand and led him out of the town. And when he had spit on his eyes and put his hands upon him, he asked of him if he saw aught. Verse 24. And he looked up and said, I see men as trees walking. After that, he put his hands again upon his eyes and made him look up. And he was restored. And saw every man clearly. And he sent him away to his house, saying, Neither go into the town, nor tell it in any to any in the town. So if we're just deciding to read, we, I don't know if you've ever opened your Bible and let it fall open and pick a passage. This, this might seem a little strange if you just stumbled upon this and read it for what it was and stopped where we did. So I have a question. Why didn't Jesus heal the blind man completely the first time? You ever thought about that? I have. It's the God of all creation and spoken word has hung the stars in the sky. And it seems almost as if it were a mistake. We know that, that, that it wasn't. And it wasn't because his power is limited to heal or not heal. But, but why did Jesus ask the man 
what he saw. At first he could see nothing, and then he could see partially. I know my wife is talking about having to go back to the optometrist, get her eyes checked, and I can say that I'm probably not long behind her. Um, I see a few pair of glasses in here tonight. But it'd be nice if the Lord would come in and heal all our eyes. Somebody made a comment at conference that I had never really considered. And uh, I guess there is something to be said about growing old and your eyes growing dim. You know, it's just part of the natural process of, of aging. And uh, so, but, but this man was blind and Jesus spit on the ground, made some mud, covered his eyes and then says, what do you see? Well, I see men as trees. He did it again. So, I don't know what it was, but we'll keep going. That's probably why I saw trees, men as trees. Had some dirt in his eye after the mud was gone. You know, it'll get something in your eye. And it's most time it's an eyelash anyway. But. Uh, so let's look at the let's look at the surrounding text of this. Let's look at verse 14. Back up a little bit with me. Verse 14. Now the disciples had forgotten to take bread. Neither had they in the ship with them more than one loaf. And he charged them, saying, Take heed, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and of the leaven of Herod. And they reasoned among themselves, saying, It is because we have no bread. And when Jesus knew it, he saith unto them, Why reason ye? Because ye have no bread. Perceive ye not yet, neither understand. Have ye your heart yet hardened? Having eyes, see ye not. And having ears, hear ye not. And do ye not remember? When I break the five loaves among five thousand, how many baskets full of fragments took ye up? Then say unto him, they say unto him, twelve. And when the seven among four thousand, how many baskets full of fragments took ye up? And they said, seven. And he said unto them, how is it that ye do not understand? So then when we would keep reading, and when we read our text, verse 22 through 26, about Jesus healing a blind man. So let's go to the portion immediately following. Try 27, verse 27. I'm kind of doing this a little backwards, but it's for a purpose. And Jesus went out and his disciples into the towns of Caesarea Philippi. And by the way, he asked his disciples, saying unto them, Whom do men say that I am? And they answered, John the Baptist. Some say Elias, and others, one of the prophets. And he saith unto them, But whom say ye that I am? And Peter answered and saith unto him, Thou art the Christ. And he charged them that they should tell no man of him. So one thing I'd like to point out, uh, I want to pause here just for a moment. And, and this is all happening at the same time. Um, I want to I want to bring something to your attention. Put your finger there just for a moment. Let's go to Judges 14. I, I want to use this for uh, an example because this is not typical. There are plenty of places in Scripture where there are time that lapses, and I want to show you a place that, that just one place happened. Judges 14 and 5. Then went Samson down and his father and his mother to Timnath and came to the vineyards of Timnath. And behold, a young lion roared against him. And the Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon him, and he rent him as he would have rent a kid, and he had nothing in his hand. But he told not his father or his mother what he had done. And when he went down and talked with the woman, and she pleased Samson well. And after a time, he returned to, to take her and turn aside to see the carcass of the lion. And behold, there was a swarm of bees and honey in the carcass of the lion. And he took thereof in his hands, and he 
went on eating, and he came to his father and mother, and they gave him, and they did eat. And he told them, and he told not them that he had taken the honey out of the carcass of the lion. So the other day, it, it, it struck me. The thought came to my mind. Okay, so here Samson is. He killed a lion. And in the very next scripture, it says that he got honey. I got my wheels turning. So I went to DuckDuckGo. And I asked, not Google. I went to DuckDuckGo and I asked him, I said, how long does it take for bees to make a hive? And it's about five months it is the minimum that it takes for bees to build a hive. So in this one scripture, there was, there's more time than that passed because the ceremonial law for betrothal, which is what Samson was doing, to, to, to the time they were to be married was a year. So this is, this is what studying the word of God is all about. So that one scripture, that one transition from the, the, from the scripture that he killed the lion with his bare hands to the, time, the next scripture that he ate the honey was at least a year that had, time had passed. That's pretty wild. That's pretty amazing. And so these are things that we have to look out for. These are things that we have to be uh, aware of. But in this text that we have read tonight, and I want to go back to Mark chapter 8, this text, this was taking place all about the same time. All right? So this was not something where a bunch of time had passed. So let's make some observations from Mark chapter 8. We have, there are three, basically, there are three dialogues that are going on. So dialogue is a conversation. It's a question and an answer. And in all three passages that we've read tonight, Jesus asks, a question. In the first episode, the first uh, verses 8 through 14, this dialogue is with Jesus and his disciples. The third episode is also with Jesus and his disciples. But the middle episode is a little different. Verses 22 through 26. Jesus is actually conversing with the blind man. But this conversation is bracketed before and after with the conversation with his disciples. It's a dialogue. It's a discourse. So there are some things that were taking place. The middle episode, verses 22 through 26, do we see any of our former, any of the tools that we've already um, learned about, do we see any of those tools in place? Verses 22 through 26. You see any repetition? Huh? Okay. <laughs> Let me get my ears checked too. Huh? Blind man. So we see a repetition. And they bring a blind man unto him in verse 22. Verse 23. And they took the blind man by the hand. In verse, in the same verse, and the Lord had already touched him and he asked him if he saw. Verse 24. And the blind man, what did he do? He looked up and he said, I see. So we're starting to see a little repetition of things that are the same, they're repeating themselves, and it's all about one thing, and it's about the sight. It's about what's taking place specifically with the blind man. But Jesus had been talking with his disciples in the previous verses about their sight. So considering what we're seeing with the terms of seeing and blind man, it's interesting to note that the Lord was trying to show the disciples something. Do you see this yet? It's funny. It's the same thing Jesus said. 
He said, verse 17, Why reason ye? Because ye have no bread. Perceive ye not yet, neither understand. Have you yet? Have ye your heart yet hardened? What's going on, my brothers? What's, what's taking place? We just fed the 5,000. We just fed the 7,000. Were you not there? How many baskets of bread did we take up after we were done? And then all of a sudden, in the Andrews, a blind man. And the Lord heals him. Note that seeing, the, seeing in the blind man is being used literally and referring to literal vision. In the first few verses, however, seeing is used figuratively when Jesus was speaking to the disciples. He wasn't talking about their eyes. He was talking about their heart and their faith. But finally, it started to sink in in verse 29. And he saith unto them, But whom say ye that I am? And Peter answered and saith unto him, Thou art the Christ. I see. I see, I see says the blind man. Do you see what just took place? In this few short verses, three different episodes, there was a discourse, there was a dialogue that was taking place. It was a back and forth. But in the middle of it was lodged an illustration, a physical illustration to the disciples about what was taking place in their life. This is very powerful. Do you, can you not see what is taking place? I mean, I feel that way tonight. Can, can we not really understand or perceive in the spirit what is going on in this world that we're living in? Amen. Now is, we, can, we can get in a place where we get frustrated, we get discouraged because of things that we see. And no, there is no doubt in my mind the disciples must have been feeling this very same thing. They, they see only partially. I pray tonight, God, help us open our eyes in the spirit. God, help us tonight to, to, to see what you're doing in the, in the realm of the spirit, to understand what is taking place in our world, in our life, in our heart, in our mind, in our family, in, in everything that we do. Don't, don't let me get so in a place, God, that I miss what you're trying to do. So they see partially, and then the Lord in all of his patience, by the third set of scriptures that we read tonight, they begin to see, and then they acknowledge him for who he was. The blind man was an illustration of the process that the disciples were experiencing, not in the carnal realm, but in the spiritual realm. It's not so much a story about Jesus as healing as it is about the man's seeing. If, if you know, we, we talk about how God is an old time God and he knows everything. And, and, and there was a place in scripture where he says, I must needs go through Samaria. Amen. And, and it's because it's all God's timing. It's all his plan. Amen. So therefore, the, I think of it this way. Somewhere in life, this man was blind. But yet at this moment in time, for the point of the disciples to begin to understand who he was, he had an encounter with Jesus. He was, he was there for that moment and he was healed because God put his hands on him and brought miraculous healing to his body. Amen. But the more important thing was the disciples began to see who he was. And I'm going to say this because uh, this is just one instance. There were other instances that I had. But, but this is used, this uh, seeing a discourse, not just... Um, reading a short passage of scripture, but 
reading before and reading after, getting a clear picture of what's going on. This is used quite frequently throughout Scripture. Um, there, there's another place uh, in, in Corinthians that, that Paul used, Apostle Paul, uh, where he used this illustration. Or he used this method of discourse. And he, was, he would tell something and then he would come back and, and he would expound on it again. But <clears throat> there's another part of this and that is uh, major breaks and pivots. In a discourse, major breaks and pivots. As we begin to read larger units of text, we have to look for critical places where the story seems to take a new turn in the form of a major break. The writer will change topics and shift from doctrinal discussion to practical or application. Um, in Ephesians, the first three chapters of Ephesians, Apostle Paul is dealing with doctrinal issues. He is dealing with their, the, uh, those at Ephesians, Ephesus, their new life in Christ, and then the implications. He was dealing with unity between the Jew and the Gentile, between those that knew God and those that didn't, and they were coming in. They were not born Jew, and he was dealing with this. But in chapter, starting in chapter 4 and going through the rest of Ephesians, you, you can read it, he begins to tell them how to do it. He begins to explain to them detail of how they should live out and apply their new life in Christ. Romans chapter 1 through 11, he deals with these things as well, doctrinally. We know that this is a letter to the church. But in starting in chapter 12, going through the end of the book of Romans, he tells us how to execute these things. Those are called major breaks or pivots. He's, he's telling, he's giving us instruction. He's giving us vital things regarding the kingdom of God. Or he's giving them, and, and then all of a sudden he begins to change and he begins to go into depth. And how, you know, the, I remember hearing a story, I know it probably wasn't true, but there was a computer that went down in New York and this uh, computer man was called, repair guy, and he walked in and they showed him where the technical room was, and he walked back there and spent about two minutes. And the computers came back up, and he walked out and gave him a bill that said it's $500. And uh, so the clerk says, well, sir, I'm going to need an itemized bill. So he went back out to his truck, came back in a couple minutes later, and he said, here's the bill. And the bill, it showed Four hundred and ninety-nine dollars and seventy-five cents to know how to turn the screw, and twenty-five cents to turn the screw. <laughs> <laughs> what good is information if we don't know how to apply it? Next time you call for a computer repair man, keep that in mind, Sister Stone. <laughs> we'll we'll get it all figured out. But but this is this is a this is a tool that is used in the Word of God. This is this is something that we can refer to. Look for these things um, as you read the Word of God. Now a pivot, a good example of a pivot occurs in, in the Old Testament in second chapter of Samuel. The first half of the chapter of Second Samuel. It's about David's rise to power. Everything is going great. Peachy king. He wins the war, civil war. He succeeds Saul as king. He conquers Jerusalem. He brings the Ark of the Covenant back to his new capital. He receives the covenant from God. Every battle that David wins or goes into battle with in 2 Samuel... The first part of 2 Samuel, he wins. He defeated the Philistines, the Moabites, the Edomites, the Ammonites, and the Arabians. Life is all good for David. But then the second half of the book is incredibly different. 
All, almost all of the events in David's life in the second part, second Samuel, are negative. David's eldest son, Amnon, rapes Tamar. Amnon's half-sister, prompting Absalom, Tamar's brother, to kill Amnon. Absalom, a son whom David loves, conspires against him, creating another civil war. David is forced to flee Jerusalem. Eventually, Absalom is defeated and killed, and David remains heartbroken. Next, another rebellion arises. And then David finally ends his career by fighting the Philistines again. In contrast to the other earlier stories in the life of David, he suffers defeat. Becomes exhausted and must be rescued by his troops. Other heroes have to kill these giants. The difference between the first half and the second half of the book of 2 Samuel is striking. The strong, victorious, confident David in the first half of the book is contrasted sharply with the insecure, weak, and insane indecisive David in the second half. So what happened in the middle? This is what the pivot is. Where does the pivot occur and what happens to bring it all about? Anybody want to take a guess? Bathsheba. Bathsheba. This is the pivot. And, and there, there is, I mean, I know it spans an entire book But David had cruised through life as the beloved, respected national hero. But after his sin, his magnificent reputation began to unravel. And this is something that we can look forward to finding in the Word of God. The pivot. Have there been any pivots in your life? Mine was the day I received the Holy Ghost. Mine was the day that I came into the house of God and my life was in a mess and I was broken and I was uh, in a hope. Brother and sisters don't know all about that because I received the Holy Ghost here. But that moment changed my life forever. Each one of you have a pivot in your life. But, but when you read the Word of God, these are things you're going to find. You're going to find the discourse. You're going to make sure you're looking for this. Make sure you're looking uh, for the, the bigger picture of a passage of scripture because how, how many tonight had ever seen in Mark chapter 8 what we uncovered? Have, has anybody ever seen that in the way that it was brought out tonight? It's pretty interesting. And this, this comes from this is a methodical way of studying the word. I will tell you that it is an academic way of studying the word. But it is a very powerful tool because when you apply this with the Holy Ghost and the spirit of revelation, the things that we have in the power of the Holy Ghost inside of us, it, it, it'll, it'll, it'll be amazing in the life of a believer. Amen. And uh, I, I had never seen that. This is, I, I saw it several years ago when I had to go through the book. And I, I really, really uh, was impacted by this because... There's so much to the Word of God. There's so much. It is alive. You're never going to learn all about it. You're never going to find the ins and the outs and say, I've conquered it. There's a lot of things we can do that in life. People climb Mount Everest and they conquer that mountain. Amen. But I'm glad that we have a God that gave us a living, breathing Word. And it's alive. Amen. I'm thankful for that tonight. So discourse, look for discourse. Major points major breaks in scripture when you're reading and we, we've kind of hit some of this uh, in the sentence and paragraph form we've got some I've given you some a handout there of some words and some uh, tools to look at as you're reading but that's on a smaller level and so tonight was about looking at a an entire text possibly even a chapter or more uh, we pointed out the book of Romans the first 11 chapters and then the last 12 through 16 in the book of Ephesians. So these are discourses. And uh, just make sure that you 
look for these things. See if you can notice them. See if you can find them. And then pivots. I believe the, the day of Pentecost was a pivot. So, anyway. Anybody got any comments or questions tonight on this? Anybody got anything they want to add to this? Amen. We're, we're, we're digging. Yes, sir. Brother, I want to say this. You know, God is definitely in every situation, even this word tonight that you brought forth. Uh, the reason I say that is just last week with Haley's situation, as much as I have preached and taught and, and realized who God really is, did I really realize who he really is? Yeah. And God has really dealt with me in the last week over this because that's where the church is at, brother. Yep. Yeah. We all need to realize who, just exactly what kind of God he is, who he is, and what he's capable of. <laughs> it's not by chance that this is taking place tonight. Nope. He, I find it amazing that he's, he, he's such a God that in Mark chapter 8, he's walking and talking with his disciples and then shows them an object lesson. I love object lessons. I like learning with my hands. But then opens the eyes of the blind man and then continues his lesson. Never, never missed a beat, never stubbed a toe, never stopped. And just, he was, it, at one point I could see a little bit of frustration. Have, have your hearts yet hardened? Have you... Have you been to the point where you, you're so carnal that you can't even see? The aid with him. The aid with him. They picked up the remaining baskets of the blessing that he fed. Yeah. And here, and, and I, I really don't see this any different. Here we have the, the greatest gift in life, the Holy Ghost. We are sitting on this world's greatest treasure. Eternity's greatest treasure. And it ought to help us. It ought to motivate us and challenge us to walk closer with God. I came in earlier and was praying, and I just I, I couldn't help it. Uh, I was thinking that Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve fell. He came in the garden, the cool of the day. Adam, where art thou? He knew where they were. He, Adam knew where he was. But that relationship was strained, but it was restored. On the death, burial, and resurrection of our Lord and Savior. And now we have that same fellowship. It may not be the Garden of Eden. Scott's Hill may be the closest thing to the Garden of Eden we'll ever see until we reach heaven. But we have that, that same fellowship. We have that same, when, when he comes looking, his spirit comes searching. Amen. I believe it was the same thing that Adam felt. The same thing that Adam experienced. That same fellowship that when we come and wherever it is, in the house of God or somewhere in your prayer closet at home, we have that same experience. Amen. Amen. I'm excited tonight, and I'm thankful to be in the house of the Lord. And I hope you've received something from this. Anybody else got a comment? Any comments or questions? We've still got a few weeks to go um, on this. There's still a lot to dig out. And... Uh, I want to encourage you.